Brian Claudius, Application Scientist at Zurich Instruments. Today, I will show you how to squeeze more out of your measurements with modern lock-in amplifier technology. Why is this even necessary? Let's have a look at what is actually measured in photonics. Now, we have different examples and applications like linear spectroscopy, where we measure absorption, terahertz time domain spectroscopy, where we measure the change of the polarization state and therefore can map out then the actually um, electric field of the impinging terahertz or middle infrared light field. Um, in uh, SRS microscopy, we can um, we characterize, measure the pump pulse loss and in laser voltage probing, we measure the reflectivity. Now, what is very important to understand is what are the typical effect sizes? The effect sizes in general are very small. Um, this is a big advantage of photonics that we can measure small signals. For example, um, with linear spectroscopy, we can easily measure down to 10 to the minus 8 uh, in transmission change, or we, cha we, we measure a change in uh, the terahertz light field, which induces a, a, a refractive index change of only 10 to the minus 8 as well. Similar uh, thing is correct for the SRS microscopy also there, uh, the, the changes are really minute. And this small effects we measure on top of sometimes a big signal, so if this example there, there's a very tiny signal on top of a big offset, or we measure a signal, we want to measure a signal deeply buried in noise. And there it is crucial to minimize the measurement time and squeeze out the maximum information of the signal which you get from your experiment. Now, what to expect in the next 25 minutes? Um, we will address a few questions. First of all, how do lock-in amplifiers actually get more information out of a signal, for example, in contrast to only digitizing the signal? How to recover more information from a signal with multiple modulations? And we will also have a look how to analyze a pulsed signal from your experiment. Now, um, we, will, uh, we will have different typical applications. It's linear spectroscopy. We have scattering SNOM where we have um, the modulated light impinging on the AFM tip, for example, and this confining the actual light field into a very tiny um, space-time volume um, on the sample. And of course, we also have pump probe measurement. We will talk about all of those in a little bit. But first of all, let me uh, spend a few words on our company, Zurich Instruments. There, we have a clear mission. We want to provide the best in-class dynamic signal instruments for advanced R&D labs, as well in academia, as in industry. How do we do that? We produce our instruments, for example, lock-in amplifiers, boxcar averages, impedance analyzers, or quantum control, uh, comp quantum computing control systems by taking off-the-shelf hardware, of course, with adequate speed, high sensitivity, low noise, and so on. This is also what even some of our users actively do. But what makes the difference, what adds the value to, the, to this hardware is the software because here it differentiate, differentiate, good software differentiates if you ha can have efficient workflows, um, def defines how the functionality and the features looks, but also how the user interface and the APIs are accessible. And one big advantage there is, even when instruments are in the field, we can add new software and therefore increase the value of our instruments in your lab, for example, over time. And now let's jump back to the topic again and have a look where is the information in the signal actually contained. In the first example we have uh, some change in the parameter where we see this kind of jump here. So the amplitude of this in a certain duration is the, the, the measure of the effect. Um, if we add a sinusoidal modulation for example by using a mechanical light chopper wheel uh, in the laser beam this leads then to a periodic signal and there we can then measure the amplitude of the signal and the phase. 
if we have multiple of those modulations in the same signal, it will result in a, in a mixture of periodic signals like uh, depicted here at the bottom right. And there we can measure multiple parameters, always the phase and the amplitudes of the different uh, modulation signals. Now, let's jump to the first uh, and have a close look at this. So, the tip, how does this sig typical signal look like? We have a jump, we have a parameter variation here, which is time dependent. Now, to optimize the signal to noise ratio of this signal, of this uh, experiment, you need to capture all signal components to maximize this uh, amplitude here and you want to suppress as much noise as possible. The noise depicted basically in this band around uh, the actual state. Um, so the first approach is to digitize an average. Um, before we look into that, we want to have a quick look if we can kind of categorize um, optical experiments. And in the end, we fit, we, in, if we look at different experiments, we have a pump probe set up here at the left hand side, we have a, a spectroscopy set up at the, at, in the middle, and on the right hand side, we also have a terahertz time domain spectro, uh, terahertz, ta terahertz time domain um, setup. We find that all setups con consist actually of four functional sections. They are, we always have the source, we have the actual experiment depicted in orange, and we have the detector followed by the signal, signal analysis. The signal analysis is only showed here in the experiment in the middle, but the others have it as well, otherwise we wouldn't be able to read about the results in the papers. So all of those building blocks contribute with uh, specific noise sources. Let's have a look at a typical uh, noise background on the lower right hand side. You see the power spectral density depicted over the frequency. And you can immediately see that we have a noise component which goes with 1 over f. This is the gray part. It's typical inherent uh, detector noise which is always there. Um, we have a white uh, noise floor uh, here depicted in light blue. This is the shot noise quantum noise and ideally what the noise which we want to reach. On top of that, of course, we also have noise spikes coming from uh, different pickups of whatever power line um, or some mobile radio connect connectivity around the lab or very, very famous sputtering machines in the lab right on the floor above you. Um, the first approach is now um, to, get, to get down the noise that we average, and the averaging is kind of a low-pass filtering. Therefore, we depicted this here uh, in, this, in this dark blue uh, area. And now if we, it, 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 we can immediately see to gain in signal to noise, because the noise is always what is still contained in this filter function, we would immediately gain in the moment when we can shift this somewhere here in the, in, in the area where we have less noise uh, in our spectrum. And this is precisely what we do by adding a modulation. So we modulate the photon beam, then we analyze the signal with a lock-in amplifier or box curvature, for example, and um, it is crucial to choose the modulation frequency in the low noise regime. Um, on the right hand side you see kind of three examples and on the left hand side you see um, some signal depicted over time and here I choose the very same filter window but I set the modulation frequency which we analyze to different frequencies. You can immediately see that the DC measurement depicted in blue has way more noise than for example the measurement where we modulate at whatever 500 hertz, 5 megahertz or at an even higher frequency. Um, just because questions will come up, I separated them on purpose. We still measure the same value, of course. Now, um, how does this look? How does this now look in the actual uh, signal? How does where is the information contained? We want to measure the phase and the amplitude of the signal, and therefore 
we now will look in um, how a lock-in amplifier actually works, how it recovers the signal. This is great. Now, um, first of all, the lock-in amplifier takes the signal which is which which we measure um, and multiplies it with a so-called reference signal. The reference fr signal is the signal at with, with the very same frequency at which we modulate. This output we send into a low-pass filter. The low-pass filter actually um, does, uh, um, does an averaging there uh, in time domain and filters in the frequency domain. This is depicted on the bottom right. You see uh, the filter function. You can also see the behavior, the result of the lock and amplifier is very similar to this of a very precise bandpass filter. Now, there are three parameters which you can set in the lock ins and which are crucial to get a great measurement. First of all, it's the modulation frequency. You should choose it in the low, low noise regime. Um, in addition, it is the filter bandwidth. So it's the width of the filter and it's the filter order. The filter order defines kind of how steep your filter goes and how, uh, for example, well it can cut off such a spurious, uh, annoying additional signal out of the filter, which you don't want. Now, before we go into the detail how to set the filter, let's have a look how this looks for a uh, signal now with multiple modulations. For multiple modulations, we have um, the following. The fundamentals of the modulation are depicted here and here. They are completely independent. Now, we need to have some interaction between the two modulated signals. Um, we'll come in a minute what this can very much be. Um, the interaction will, will uh, basically provide you a signal like this. So this is, uh, in the end, a multiplication and a modulation of a carrier signal. And this creates sidebands to your carrier big omega, a lower and an upper sideband. And now again, the signal of both is contained in, the, in those sidebands, and we can analyze them and measure them with two different ways, either the tandem demodulation or a direct AM-FM demodulation. Let's have a closer look at um, why this is important. Um, this is important because um, nonlinearities in your experiment have an effect on um, the different signals. For example, if you have a nonlinearity with only one modulation, you um, get harmonics of your fundamental. And um, if you have two modulations, nonlinearities will lead to multiple sidebands. Um, for example, uh, you have the carrier signal large omega here, and you have multiple sidebands in the same way as you have the harmonics to the fundamental signal of your uh, of your small modulation frequency. And now the, the ratio of the different sidebands precisely contains the information about the nonlinearity and therefore it contains really valuable information um, about what is going on in your experiment. So this is the information which you want to measure. Therefore, you want to analyze more sidebands, ideally as many sidebands as possible, um, and get more information of the linear interaction. One example is um, scattering SNOM I mentioned in the very beginning. There you have a carrier, uh, for example, from a modulated um, laser beam uh, or, or, or ultra short laser beam impinging on your AFM tip. And you have, in addition, the carrier, uh, uh, so the, the modulation frequency of your cantilever uh, at a lower frequency and the near field effect um, adds then some harmonics here and this in combination with the light field creates those sidebands. So let's have a look at the two methods uh, to recover the information of those uh, signals with multiple sidebands. We have the tandem demodulation and the direct AF FM demodulation. The tandem demodulation is actually a two-step process which also requires 
two locking amplifiers. First, we take a signal from our experiment um, and feed it into the lock-in. We demodulate at the carrier frequency with a filter bandwidth which is broad enough uh, to capture the sidebands we want to look at. Then we feed the output signal of the lock of this first lock-in into the second lock-in amplifier, and there we demodulate with the reference frequency at small omega. So there is no need for uh, the lock-in amplifier to, to follow the frequency combi uh, combination. Um, but you have the disadvantage that in the signal um, of the sec uh, in the signal which you get in the very end, of course, there is a certain mixture of the upper and lower sideband information. Now, this is different if you use an AM-FM demodulation directly. There, you feed the signal from your experiment into your lock-in amplifier and you provide both frequencies, the carrier frequency and the lower modulation frequency, to the lock-in amplifier. And since the lock-in amplifier, modern lock-in amplifier, has the capability of calculate from those reference signals directly the uh, frequency of the lower and the upper sidebands or other sidebands, you're able to directly demodulate at the sidebands without having an additional uh, lock-in amplifier in between. The big advantage, the lock-in amplifier will automatically follow the frequency combination and you can freely choose which frequency combination you want to follow. Now, if you, have, if you demodulate maybe even very closely to the carrier, you want to have, of course, you choose the best possible filter um, to discriminate and, not, and have no leakage from the carrier, for example. Therefore, it's crucial uh, to select the right filter settings. Let's have a look how uh, the filter actually affects the signal. Um, here, first we look at the um, filter bandwidth. The bandwidth is inversely proportional to the time constant. And we see in, kind of in the time domain, the longer uh, the time constant, the slower the settling, but also the more narrow the filter function in the frequency domain. What is very important to note here, the measurement bandwidth should always be as narrow as possible to avoid, uh, to, to avoid too much noise, but it still needs to support all signal components. Let's make an example. In the lower right hand corner, you see the band bandwidth comparison. The first signal, yeah, we can follow everything, but it's pretty noisy. Um, if we reduce, in this case, the bandwidth by a factor of five, we end up with a very clean um, and two pronounced peaks. If we reduce it further by a factor of two, uh, five, then um, the, signal, the noise is even better, but the signal is gone. And this then has a disadvantage that you cannot use this. Of course, naturally, the settings of choice is the one in the very center. How to do it on the filter order? The filter order is even more crucial if you have uh, signals very close to each other. The higher the filter order, the steeper the filter function. You see this in the steep frequency response in the frequency domain. But of course, also here, the step response gets a little bit delayed. Um, for the signal in general, the filter, uh, filter order should be as low as possible so that you have, have as small of a delay as possible, suppressing all spurious signals outside of the measurement bandwidth. And, and you know, in the case of multiple uh, modulations, for example, the carrier, and it needs to be narrow and steep for the sideband demodulation. Again, we have an example here. Um, the third order field in this measurement um, allows some leakage of a spurious signal. Therefore, we have this uh, wiggling on top of the actual signal. If we choose the eighth order filter with the very same bandwidth, of course, we see that uh, this, DC, this offset goes down. We have a very clean and nice signal. And now to show you why this is important, I have a real life example. It is crucial to optimize the filter conditions. Why? Because we want to have optimized signal to noise ratio. Um, I have here an image of, a, of an SRS um, microscopy. And you can see on the top one, we have a pretty clear image. Of course, there's still noise. 
we cannot get an image without noise, yeah. Um, but the 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 the, core, the borders are here pretty pronounced. The contrast is good. Now with the same with with worse filter settings, um, with the same measurement time, we get more noise visible here in the in the area where we have less signal. But we also see it um, that the that those edges are kind of smeared out. And this is, of course, what we don't want to have. We always want to achieve the best possible signal to noise ratio with minimum measurement time. Now, this measurement, as I mentioned, it's an SRS measurement, so it's a pump probe microscopy measurement. Here, actually, the signal is a pulse form. So the question is, is there a better way to recover the information? Let's have a look at the example. Here I have the overview of a typical pump probe measurement. What this microscopy measurement is, of course. So we have a pump and a pulse, a, a pump and a probe pulse. The pump pulse um, induces some kind of uh, see some change in your in our actual sample, and then it imprints uh, the signal on the coincided co coinciding probe pulse example visualized here. Changing the delay between the two of them allows us um, to recover signals um, and transient changes which are on the order of the pulse duration of the of the two pulses and not given for example by the detection electronics. So this is really great to look for ultra fast phenomena. Now, um, for example, here we have the example that we have um, a probe, a, a pump beam coinciding on every other probe. So this means only every second uh, pulse carries information. How do we analyze this? If we look at the signal depicted now in orange, um, and we look at what the lock-in amplifier will do, it captures one harmonic in the time domain. It uh, we show here the reference signal as a sinusoidal wave and in the frequency domain we see that we capture the signal at the first harmonic. Now what we also see very clearly in the frequency domain, there is more signal. The signal is actually at the harmonics of the fundamental and now the question is how can we capture this in addition? We can capture it by using a so-called boxcar average. The boxcar average principle is depicted here. We measure only during a tiny time window um, where the actual pulse and therefore the signal is present. And um, for example, here we show uh, we basically use normal rectangular signal and we capture the fundamental more or less also mainly, but also we see something at the third uh, harmonic. Now the more narrow we make this window, the broader we span um, the response function in the frequency domain and the more we capture data at the higher frequencies. We can e go even further. Um, we can even, since we, we, we keep in mind that we have a signal in every second pulse, so what we, would, what we can do, we can even uh, take um, a second boxcar window and subtract it from the first and therefore resemble something which is even more similar like the sinusoidal function. This is the so-called so baseline suppression and it has the big advantage that it, um, it, it doesn't capture the DC component, what the normal, what the normal boxcar do, does. And it only captures the signal at the harmonics of interest. So we clearly see that uh, the boxcar average can here have uh, advantage because it captures more signal at the harmonics of the fundamental modulation frequency and that this has a very practical implication maybe for your measurement. I would like to share you the next slide about a stimulated Raman scattering microscopy measurement where um, uh, uh, SRS image was captured point by point using the pump probe uh, scheme here at the uh, at the left uh, at the bottom left. It is a 40 mega. It's based on a 40 megahertz fiber laser, which is pulse picked on the Stokes uh, branch 
to 20 megahertz so that we see a pump loss on every second pulse of um, uh, in, 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 induced via the Raman process by the 20 megahertz probe uh, uh, Stokes beam. And if we compare the pixel dwell time on the two images, which have the same signal to noise ratio, we see that the box color averager can actually measure twice as fast than with the lock-in amplifier. Uh, and note, this is the very same measurement, the very same signal. This can be even, uh, the speed up can be even bigger if, for example, the duty cycle is smaller or the noise is, uh, in a, is a different one. Um, with this, I would like to summarize what we learned today. First of all, we learned how lock-in amplifiers foster information by actually doing something like a bandpass filter and suppressing all the unwanted noise. In addition, we, we saw that modern lock-in amplifiers can directly demodulate, at, uh, demodulate AM, FM modulated signals and therefore recover signals of sidebands directly without the need of tandem demodulation, for example. We also saw that boxcar averages can be advantageous for pulse signals. And I very much hope that I could show and convince you on how to squeeze out more information of your signal in the same measurement time. Thanks for joining in. If you have more questions, get in touch, reach out and let's discuss. Oh.